Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. On behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the DeKalb County Public Library, welcome to another one of our virtual author talks. We started these a little over two months ago um, when the pandemic caused our library system to close, um, and we will continue to do these in the future. The good news is our library system will begin and reopening shortly. We are going to start doing curbside pickup at DeKalb County Public Library. So I encourage everyone to go to the library's website, dekalblibrary.org, and look and see what our plans are for opening our book drops, collecting the books that are out in circulation right now, and then letting you be able to put holds on books and pick them up safely at our library branches. I would also like to thank our sponsor, the DeKalb Library Foundation. They're the fundraising arm of our library system that goes out and raises funds for things that the tax base doesn't cover. So wonderful programs like A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten and Take the Internet Home that provides at-home internet in small little um, compact cases with uh, Verizon jetpacks to let those who cannot access the internet in parts of our county get online, browse the internet, and apply for jobs. So thank you to the Cab Library Foundation. Additionally, we'd like to thank them for upping that membership to Zoom because we can now allow more participants in our virtual author talks than we have than ever before. So thank you once again to the DeKalb Library Foundation. I would also like to point out that if you would like to purchase tonight's book, you can do so from Karis Books. Karis Books is the nation's oldest feminist bookstore and we are so pleased to have them in Decatur. They are still doing books by mail. So you can either order online with the link that will be provided with this video, or you can just give them a call and they will mail it safely to your home. If you can't, of course, order from Karis Books, we encourage you to order from any independent bookstore. During this pandemic, all of our bookstores here in DeKalb County and throughout the state of Georgia have worked countless hours putting books in the mail and getting books in your hands when sometimes library systems couldn't. So we thank all of our independent bookstores especially our black owned independent bookstores and businesses. So please continue to support them as we continue to work through this pandemic. Just a few housekeeping rules. I see most of you right now are muted. So please do so if you haven't done that, just go ahead and mute the microphone at the top right hand side of your screen on most devices. If you would like to ask a question, you could either type it into the chat or feel free to raise your hand and we will recognize you at the end of the program and you can ask the question yourself. We ask that you don't directly message our speaker this evening. Uh, we just wanna keep things flowing nicely and don't want to have their talk interrupted by a screen popping up um, during their presentation. So tonight's presentation is of course about Flannery O'Connor and Flannery O'Connor has been in the news quite a bit lately. Not exactly, um, positive, but um, it gives us the ability to have discussions, which we should have discussions about literature. And I think that when we do this, we all should be mindful of each other's opinions and where we come from as individuals. And I think as a literary community, we have always embraced each other's opinions and we do so with an openness and with an empathy that is not found probably in any other community. Um, we of course have several um, talks on Flannery O'Connor coming up as well as other folks like Carson McCullers. Um, and while she has been in the news, she's also been in many publications right now. There are several books that have just come out, including our authors this evening, books for children, books for adults, poetry. People still want to talk about Flannery O'Connor. So that's what we're going to do the good, the bad, and the ugly. Flannery O'Connor, of course, looms so very large in Georgia's literary heritage. Um, you know, she started very, very young drawing portraits and pictures of the chickens on the farm, making a chicken walk backwards. You know, she took that artistic eye that she had to college where she made line of cuts for her school newspaper, sometimes disparaging the wax on campus and then of course, if you had the um, joy of going to Andalusia, you saw several of her self portraits with peacocks and otherwise. 
So Flannery O'Connor always had an artistic eye. She also had a great love for literature and symbolism. And she brought these to her work as well. So tonight's book, Sign Language, Flannery O'Connor's graphic narrative by Ruth Reinisch talks about that. How Flannery O'Connor used both her artistic eye and her narrative voice to create these beloved and strange characters in these unique landscapes, in these unique ways that show off a truly unique and powerful voice in Southern literature. So thank you all for coming and please welcome Ruth Reinisch. Ruth? Hello. Um, all right, so uh, I thank you for uh, being here and for giving me a chance to talk about my work. Um, I want to start out, um, even though my daughter, my daughter told me don't start out by apologizing, but I want to start out by apologizing that I won't be able to look you in the face um, because I have thought my book is largely based on images and artistic styling and technique. And I um, decided that it would be so much easier and um, simpler to talk about those techniques um, using a PowerPoint. So I am going to um, put that PowerPoint up right now and then I will begin. Right, I, I think I need to, oh wait, is this it? Is that working for everybody? Yep, looks good. Okay, thanks for answering. <laughs> All right, um, so, uh, I started to, I first got uh, interested in Flannery O'Connor back when uh, I was teaching high school and I was working on my master's degree at Grand Valley State University in Western Michigan. I took a class that was taught by Dr. Avis Hewitt, um, an introduction to Flannery O'Connor. And uh, the first book that we read for that class was Wise Blood. And reading Wise Blood for the first time was such um, an amazing experience for me that I was stopped in my tracks and I realized that I was seeing a kind of writing um, that I had not seen or had not analyzed uh, before. And so let me um, show you a little bit of my preface here. Somehow I need to get rid of these pictures on the side so I can actually read my um, PowerPoint, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, so in my preface I wrote, as I read Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood for the first time, I could not shake the feeling that I was virtually walking through an art gallery and viewing a carefully constructed series of painted canvases. The forward flow of the narrative seemed to halt, and in my mind, a complete picture formed. W.J.T. Mitchell defines this type of stylistic event as gesture, the moment when thought becomes visible, tangible, or palpable, staged and framed as form. So I thought one of the questions uh, that you might ask is, why did I connect uh, O'Connor's narrative to uh, the, the sign language or to the concept of uh, sign language. And that um, it, it starts uh, with a personal uh, story. My granddaughter, Evie, is uh, hearing impaired and she speaks both verbally and, and with sign. Um, and so throughout her uh, growing up, I have been taking ASL classes and at one time, I was in the midst of an ASL class, and suddenly I um, realized that it came over me that the signs that I was forming with my hands were both pictures and words at the same time. And the realization of this 
opened up this whole uh, world uh, for me, this whole area of study um, of how O'Connor makes her words into pictures. She constructs a textual gallery of speaking pictures that occur within the framework of her novels and short stories. These pictures painted with words assume the forms of tableau vivant, photographs, and cartoons. Just as the speaker of sign language punctuates her narrative with signs that are at once pictures and words, O'Connor punctuates the narratives of her novels with moments or pauses in the forward motion that are somehow framed in a mirror or a window, for example, and are at once pictures and words. And for this presentation, I am focusing on Wise Blood and the Violent Bear of the Way. Uh, I couldn't jam everything that I wrote about um, in my book into this presentation. So consequently, my contention is that these pictorial moments open windows into the historical past that reflect on the American present and that offer a veiled look into the mystery of a divine plan. O'Connor puts it this way, the text enables the reader to see the whole world, no matter how limited his particular scene. Seeing the whole world in a character or a phrase or a scene or a tableau is the focus of this presentation. And you will notice that I used um, stills from John Huston's uh, uh, film, Wise Blood. Uh, for some of my illustrations. So let's talk about this whole world. Um, what are the images that come to mind when you think of mid 20th century America? And um, these, uh, so I collected, I made a little collage of these uh, mid 20th century images. They show mass destruction, the bomb, war, racial unrest, Cold War, um, the effect of consumerism on women, um, the ads and consumerism mainly perpetuated by television and religious unrest. So then I made to uh, look at in comparison, a collage of the images that are bombarding us today um, in the world that surrounds us today. And you can see aside from the coronavirus, which is our largest uh, concern right in the middle of this collage, you can see that we are surrounded by images, a lot of them in the same, the same types as O'Connor. Um, political split, racial unrest, violence, poverty, pollution, and uh, religious unrest. So to begin our discussion, um, uh, so my question is, um, is O'Connor able to speak to our world as it is today um, through the use of uh, graphic narrative and sign language? And of course, I think she is, or I wouldn't have written the book. But um, I'm going to start by talking about gestures and then uh, lead from that into cartoons. So the whole world in a gesture. And I talked about, I defined, I talked about how W.J.T. Mitchell defines gesture when I read my little uh, quote from the preface. And uh, I have a definition that O'Connor um, put together, some action, some gesture of a character that is unlike any other in a story, one which indicates where the real heart of the story lies. And then my interpretation, the pictorial moments in essence, the pictures made using the medium of words illustrate a marriage between the literal and the visual, between the body and the spirit, between the finite and the infinite. So the best place to start with looking at gesture and then how gest gesture plays out through the two novels um, that, that we're going to discuss in the presentation, uh, the best place to start is with single panel cartoons. Studying O'Connor's single panel cartoons provides a template for discussing the how 
of using gesture to show the whole world in one action. In 1963, the year before her death, O'Connor wrote to her friend Janet McCain, reminiscing about her youthful dream of becoming a cartoonist. I like cartoons, she wrote. I used to try to do them myself, set a batch to the New York every week to the New Yorker. All rejected, of course. I just couldn't draw very well. This connection between New Yorker cartoons and O'Connor turned out to be just um, a wonderful um, beginning for, the, for my study of the graphic narrative or the pictorial moment. It was suggested to me um, by my dissertation advisor, Dr. Charles Scruggs, Scruggs at the University of Arizona. Um, an analysis of O'Connor's habit of art and how it develops into the particular pictorial text that is singular to O'Connor must begin in the worlds created and framed in the captioned cartoons that were published weekly in her college newspaper, The Colonnade. These speaking pictures represent a beginning point in O'Connor's development as a creator of pictorial text. Um, I also wanted to say that if you want to uh, consult or look at O'Connor's cartoon, there's a wonderful book um, by Kelly Gerald called Flannery O'Connor, The Cartoons. So um, next, I want to talk about then three New Yorker cartoonists that I feel uh, were an influence on O'Connor and whose themes um, sort of represent the themes that were in the um, the, uh, that uh, surrounded O'Connor in the context um, of her world at that time. The first cartoonist I'd like to look at is James Thurber. Uh, E.B. White once said about Thurber that all of his cartoons could be lumped under the category of uh, called the melancholy of sex. Um, and this cartoon that I have here, the Thurber cartoon, I'd like to um, do a just read a description of this cartoon that Dorothy Parker wrote in her preface to Thurber's book Men, Women, and Dogs. The cartoon, Parker writes, the cartoon features a man, his wife, and a male guest. They're standing in something less than great, a gracious enclosure, furnished mainly with a bookcase apparently ordered by mail from the company that did uh, such notable work in Pisa. And on top of the bookcase is a woman on all fours. So help me God, there is a woman on all fours on top of the bookcase. And the host is saying, that is my first wife up there. And this is my present Mrs. Harris. So this was my choice to um, exemplify the melancholy of sex. And you can see below it, I put uh, a picture of um, Sabbath Lily in, uh, in midst of her seduction of Hazel Motes. And it's a, a also, again, a still from the John Huston movie. I looked all over through the New Yorkers as I uh, was paging through those years for uh, women cartoonists that I thought might be influences on O'Connor. And uh, the most published woman that I found was Helen E. Hokanson. She even had some New Yorker covers. Uh, her cartoons featured middle-aged, overweight society women who floated through life occupying a space on the margins of reality, performing the rituals of a time that has passed. And um, I know that uh, you can think of many of the, of a, at least a few of these women that floated their way uh, through O'Connor's short stories. Robert Fitzgerald wrote that George Price, he thought was the cartoonist that had the greatest effect on O'Connor. And Price specialized in um, his, human grotesques and animal observers. So if you look at the Price cartoon on this slide, you'll see a lot of different human bodies in outrageous positions, 
um, the complexity of habitus, all of the objects and uh, furniture and things that exist all around these humans, they all uh, could uh, tell their own stories. And then everything in this room is observed by animals. And you see a couple animals on the wall. And then um, also in the middle is a, a stork um, or a crane. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, um, in the middle, uh, observing human behavior. And um, the, the character, the O'Connor character that I think inherits some of this influence is Enoch Emery. And uh, I wanted to read a selection from Wise Blood uh, where Enoch is purifying his room to get it ready uh, for the uh, coming of the new Jesus. And um, but he's having a hard time working because there is a portrait or a picture of a moose um, on, the, on the wall of his room watching him. It's a brown portrait of a moose standing in a small lake. The look of superiority on this animal's face was so insufferable to Enoch that if he hadn't been afraid of him, he would have done something about it a long time ago. As it was, he couldn't do anything in his room, but what the smug face was watching. Not shocked because, uh, oh, I left that part out. I have it in my uh, script here. Um, if he had looked all over for one, he could not have found a roommate that irritated him more. Uh, so uh, those are some of those themes. Um, you are conscious of them having done a lot of reading in O'Connor, you're conscious of how those themes have played out. Um, and these are themes in that appeared in some of O'Connor's um, undergraduate cartoons, and I draw correlations between them in my book. But now I'd like to take a look at some of the cartoonish characters um, in Wise Blood. And so I call Hazel Motes and Enoch Emery elevated elevated cartoonish grotesques, and they appear in tableau, paintings, collage, and assemblage. The business of exaggerating cultural atrocities has always been the business of a cartoonist, and, um, and O'Connor does not abandon the power of this pictorial business in delivering her messages. Instead, she embraces it and envelops it in her graphic narrative. So the first um, uh, instance where I feel that O'Connor grass reaches back, um, that O'Connor wants to have a, um, sort of embellish her scenes with a whole world uh, view is the use of the Vanitas tableau in her hazel moats, a few of her hazel moats situations. Um, she puts um, hazel moats into a Vanitas position, um, the position uh, as the, the head or the death in life symbol um, three times in Wise Blood. The elements of the Vanitas tableau is uh, a death in life, and that's symbolized by the uh, skull and the bones, a snuffed out candle, which symbolizes the shortness um, of life and that it can be snuffed out at any time, and um, a memento mori, which is a warning, a written warning or a reminder of death. And uh, Vanitas has been used by artists um, starting with Brune the Elder in 1524. Um, I also picked Picasso made a, a variety of uh, Cubist uh, Vanitas uh, paintings. And in Picasso's, you can see instead of the snuffed out candle, um, he has a kerosene uh, lantern. Uh, and uh, his and Picasso's was in 1946. So let's take a look at um, Hazel Moat's appearing in a Vanitas tableau in Wise Blood, and then talk about what does um, doing this, what does placing hazel motes in this type of uh, tableau uh, do 
if for uh, the message or for the book Wise Blood as a whole. So uh, Hazel Motes is a soldier returning to Eastrad, um, his home, after World War II. And he arrives that night. The house, or in the late afternoon, the house was dark as night and open to it. And though he saw the fence around it had partly fallen and the weeds were growing through the porch floor, he didn't realize all at once that it was only a shell, that there was nothing here but the skeleton of a house. He twisted an envelope and struck a match to it and went through all the empty rooms upstairs and down. When the envelope burnt out, he lit another one and went through them all again. That night, he slept on the floor in the kitchen and a board fell on his head out of the roof and cut his face. There was nothing left in the house but the shift robe in the kitchen. His mother had always slept in the kitchen and had her walnut shift robe in there. He left a piece of paper in each of the drawers. This shift robe belongs to Hazel Moult. Do not steal it or you will be hunted down and killed. What does uh, doing this with a character uh, do to the work as a whole? It gives Hazel Modes and his pilgrimage a sense of timelessness. It puts him in a situation, a visual situation that we as readers can recognize and that we have recognized for um, a long time throughout um, the art world. It also is a foreshadowing, as the Vanitas uh, is meant to be, it's a foreshadowing of death. And it begins the death in life um, cycle and the death in life sequence that um, proceeds along through the novel Wise Blood um, and along through Hazel Moats. Hazel Maltz's pilgrimage, um, which makes him, as I call him, a dead man walking. The next character that I want to take a look at um, is Enoch Emery. And I see O'Connor assembling um, Emery in much this, uh, a similar way as um, Robert Rauschenberg did uh, with the sculpture that's on your screen. I think it's on the right side of um, your screen the, with the goat and the tire around it and the debris that the goat is standing around. Rauschenberg picked up these things, um, they, uh, these items, they were detritus um, in the streets and he picked them up and then he assembled them into um, the sculpture to make some kind of uh, comment about um, the modern world to make a uh, uh, to have a representation of the detritus of the modern world. I think this is how I think of the way um, O'Connor um, puts Enoch Emery together as a character. Um, so I, I feel like, and you can see the pieces that I put together in my little uh, collage or assemblage of Enoch as um, his new Jesus. You can see him in his room there with the new Jesus. Um, in the room staring at him. Um, and I feel like Enoch's pilgrimage is um, an up, upended salvation cycle, uh, which is based um, on and, and ends in a death, a kind of death rather than in eternal life. So it starts out with um, the ceremonial cleaning of his room and preparing the washstand um, for a uh, the uh, place to keep the uh, new Jesus um, in his room. And then he proceeds to go and perform a strange unholy uh, communion in a Walgreens drugstore where um, he's uh, preparing himself for uh, getting ready to go and steal uh, the new Jesus from the museum. And then O'Connor takes him through a movie montage. Um, uh, Enoch looks at three movies which sort of summarize um, his entire uh, life. The past, his past in the boys training school, the present where um, it's a movie called The Eye where an evil eye is staring at him 
and the future, Mighty Joe Young, uh, where an ape um, saves children and Enoch hates the ape because the ape is getting all the love and attention that Enoch would like uh, for himself. And so I see at the end of um, this Enoch salvation cycle, Enoch is in a way born again. He rejects his human body and becomes the ape. He puts on the ape suit. And, um, and so he, um, he leaves. So he too, along with Hazel Motes in my uh, description, is a dead man walking. While O'Connor, uh, while the men in uh, general in Wise Blood uh, re referred back to established art pieces or motifs, O'Connor herself constructed the women of Wise Blood by representing them as frame collages that are um, constructed with abject objects. And uh, so I'm going to just talk about Leora, Sabbath Lily, and a little bit about Ruby, who only appears in the manuscripts, but I love this um, character. So I'm just gonna use her as a introduction. Um, so these women, I describe them as living uh, on the other side of the white picket fence. And the white picket fence I'm talking about is the one that's around the uh, Cleaver house on uh, television and leave it to Beaver. Um, I don't know if everybody looks at this as the quintessential American dream house. I'm sure younger generations have something else they look at. But, um, so, uh, but still the white picket fence is still something that is mentioned and used by filmmakers and writers to signify this um, American dream. And then on the left side of the slide, I have included a picture of the real um, Levitt towns that were, um, it's an example of one that was constructed um, as a suburban uh, dwellings, uh, cheap suburban dwellings for the um, men or the families coming home in World War II. So um, 1950s television then sold America products that were must-haves and that became a part of American life. Uh, in O'Connor's, on O'Connor's bookshelf, she had the book, The Mechanical Ride by, Mechanical Bride by Marshall McLuhan. And um, I feel that um, this uh, is, uh, a lot of uh, this of McLuhan's discussion of how women were influenced by ads in women's magazines and on television and how American life was uh, uh, controlled um, by the same um, came uh, were uh, came to um, be in uh, Ruby Hill. Ruby Hill was in um, the manuscripts all the way up to just before publication. She was um, Hazel Motes' sister. Uh, she uh, was uh, lured away to run away from home by a traveling salesman, Bill Hill, because he promised, promised her all of the suburban living, the white picket fence, and the products. So, but Ruby is gone. And um, so then we meet uh, Leora Watts. And um, Leora Watts has then advertised the caption for the Leora collage is the friendliest bed in town. When Hazel Mose first enters Leora's uh, bedroom, he looks at her in her mirror. There's a mirror on her dresser and it's uh, distorted and yellowed. And he turns and looks in that mirror and looks at uh, Leora Watts sitting there in her um, pink nightgown and uh, ill-fitting pink nightgown. And that nightgown just um, causes me to have all kinds of thoughts and ideas about um, things 
that that nightgown could represent? Uh, did it fit her once? Uh, did she choose it? Did she have it when she was younger? Um, you know, I, all of those kind of things. But for but right now, it's old and tattered and ill-fitting. And also, we've seen Leora uh, clipping her uh, toenails, and on her uh, dresser is um, a clipper, a nail clipper, and, uh, a, and a jelly jar glass uh, on her dresser. And this is the collage that makes up um, Leora, uh, Leora Watts. Um, and Leora looks at us out of the frame of her uh, collage, of, out of the frame of the mirror. But her eyes, the, uh, her eyes do not focus. They're um, distorted. She's distorted in the mirror and she's static and captive um, also in the death in life positioning um, of, wise, of wise blood. To me, Leora Watts um, is part and parcel with all those women in American literature who live on the outskirts of town. The, uh, the women in the crucible who were accused of being witches um, because they were odd and they lived on the outside of town. She, to me, is, is um, an example of one of those women. Uh, those women exist throughout American, American literature and O'Connor joins um, with her, Leora joins the, um, uh, the long line of women that come before her and after her. Um, and she influences the women that come after her. Now, Sabbath Lily Hawks is one of my favorite uh, characters. And um, Sabbath, we first meet Sabbath Lily in, um, on the streets of Talkingham, where uh, she and Asa Hawks are uh, standing uh, listening to a potato peeler salesman um, selling uh, potato peelers, a little gadget, and um, Hazel Motes and Enoch Emery uh, approach and listen to the salesman too. And Sabbath desires that potato peeler. She doesn't have potatoes, she doesn't have a kitchen, but she has a huge desire for that potato peeler. And this, I think, is O'Connor again making a statement of the influence of advertisers, um, of uh, the influence uh, on uh, American women uh, about what was important. This is one of the gadgets uh, that exist after Ruby uh, has left the manuscript. And I think of Sabbath Lily in her seduction. Uh, she does the best she can. She finds out Asa Hawks isn't going to take care of her anymore. And she decides that um, she needs to uh, get uh, Hazel Motes to marry her or in some way take care of her. So she hides in the back of the Essex. And then she again appears framed by a mirror with uh, hair accessories of uh, dandelions and uh, a big uh, and lipstick uh, on her mouth. Uh, she's the, she represents in this sort of the upended, the upside down girl next door. And she actually does live next door to Hazel Moat. So she really is um, the girl next door. And I, I think about her, when I think of her, I think of the images of the young women in Coke commercials. Um, so, and then the other picture that I added to the Sabbath collage takes us to this vision of Sabbath Lily. And this vision appears in a mirror as well and framed. And I call this vision the upended Madonna. Um, Sabbath Lily changes at this point in <clears throat> Wise Blood, where she might have been the young girl next door wannabe. Um, she now uh, has a, exhibits a desire for uh, family and for, um, uh, for hazel modes and uh, for love and for a child. However, as Sabbath Lily, we start Sabbath Lily's story with a dead child and we end Sabbath Lily, Lily's story with a dead child. Um, she uh, looks, uh, she looks, she uh, it looks at that child as if um, she had never known anyone like him before. 
but there was something about him, everyone she had ever known, as if they had all been rolled into one person and killed and shrunk and dried. She began to rock him a little in her arm, and a slight reflection of a grin appeared on her face. Well, I declare, she murmured, you're right cute, ain't you? And um, to me, this, this Sabbath is reminiscent of an upended version of Da Vinci's Virgin um, on the Rocks. So, um, so uh, I just want to emphasize, um, I feel that by using these images, by um, suggesting images that come from the past, O'Connor is taking, uh, casting a cold eye on the present, the American present, and, um, and uh, offering us in wise blood a memento mori about the future, the future of America, about our own future, and the futures of the characters in wise blood. So I want to talk about um, uh, the violent Barrett away. And in that um, novel, I think O'Connor uses um, the mode and medium of uh, photography. This is the visual art that I think O'Connor applies in the violent Barrett away, um, rather than it's different from the painterly um, a constructed kind of um, art pieces that she uses in Wise Blood. Uh, the reason I pick photography is um, in the first drafts of the manuscript for the violent bear it away, there's a character named John Raber, and he's the son of the Raber that, um, that ends up in the violent bear it away. And he's, uh, he's not Bishop, but he uh, is a, a different boy. And this boy goes around with a camera around his neck. And every event that happens in these first drafts, John Raver is there to photograph it. And we see it through the camera eye of this uh, young man. And uh, that gave me the idea of looking at um, the violent bear it away through a camera eye. And so I just um, want to talk about the uh, three properties then of photography um, that I think encapsulate and make meaning uh, in, make visual meaning in um, the violent bear it away. Those three properties are the camera eye, the dual nature of photography, and questions that photographs raise about reality. Um, so uh, through the camera eye, we see the modern world captured, and we are then able to step back and look at distortions in the reality that surrounds us. So the camera eye comes from John Dos Passos, who in his novel, The 42nd Parallel, um, introduces this uh, uh, uncanny effect of the camera's eye and the writer's field of vision. Um, it allows uh, the writer to fragment, to stop or fragment time in the pictorial pauses. And in O'Connor's case, she moves, it allows her to move backward and forward in a way that diverges from the painterly technique employed in Wiseblood. Jill Baumgartner describes this at key moments often at the height of a story's crisis. Sometimes in a moment of foreshadowing, O'Connor clicks the camera and catches a strange picture. In the 17th century, these would have been called the emblematic moment. By using the photographic technique to refine her pictorial pauses in the narrative, O'Connor is able to reveal the presence and influential power of a divine realm that exists simultaneously with the historical and concrete realm in which we all live. And as I was reworking my section on the violent Barrett away today, I just realized the complexity of this novel and the complexity of what O'Connor does in this novel, novel to raise us from the historical present to the anagogical um, uh, awareness. Um, and so I want to start um, with an example, and I, the examples are, you know, there's many examples, and today I just selected uh, three or four of them that I thought would make um, my arguments clear. Um, 
Tarwater, young Tarwater, was very proud that his pilgrimage to becoming a prophet uh, began uh, when he had been born by the roadside um, in a wreck. Uh, he had always felt that it set his existence apart from the ordinary one, and he understood from it the plans of God for him were special, even though nothing of consequence had happened to him so far. So young Tarwater tells this story, and it becomes, it's starting to become um, the story, uh, his prophetic, of his uh, background, of his journey, of his pilgrimage to becoming a prophet. And um, this story of the car crash um, reminded me of the Andy Warhol paintings that were appearing around this time, the pop art where Warhol took pictures from newspapers and then um, illustrated them um, and used them to show the distortion and garishness of the modern world. Um, much of, many of the photographic sequences in the Violent Barrett Away are also indicated and told in headlines. So by using photography, um, using a pho photo photographic technique, O'Connor increases then the sense of duality, um, sort of the, the difference between the historical, um, the present, historical present, and then the anagogical, the divine present. Um, shaping the pictorial text in the novel by using conventions of photography creates a sense of instantaneity and reality largely because of the properties of the medium itself. Mid-20th mid century photography had a built-in sense of duality, since during that time, every amateur photographer received her developed photos accompanied by a negative. As one stared at the negatives, um, one could imagine some kind of altered or parallel reality, one that is very like, but the inverse of our own. In this way, O'Connor is bringing in a visual with which we're familiar um, and then using it uh, to mold um, her message. So um, I wanted to pick uh, the occasion that um, strikes me uh, the most uh, sh that shows the actual duality of photography is when um, uh, Raber decides to drown his son uh, Bishop. And um, he takes him to the beach and he wants him to be taken by an undertow. But um, Bishop then is saved, someone spots him drowning and saves them. And um, the beach, which he had thought was empty before, became peopled with strangers converting uh, converging on him in all directions. A bald-headed man in a red and blue Roman striped shorts began at once to administer artificial respiration. Three wailing women and a photographer appeared. The next day, there had been a picture in the paper showing the rescuers striped bottom forward, working over the child. Raber was beside himself, uh, was beside him on his knees, watching with an agonized expression. The caption said, Overjoyed father sees son revived. We know uh, the narrator has told us that agonized expression is there because Raber wanted to succeed in drowning Bishop. Uh, so the third uh, item then uh, that I think uh, using the uh, photographic technique brings to the violent Barrett away is questions about reality and um, this sort of photographic presence or photographic test, text um, makes mundane experiences uh, reshaped. And one uh, simple example of this is that because of old Tarwater schooling, um, the young Tarwater um, expects his own burning bush moment. He um, has learned history starting with Adam and Eve and going through the presidents of the United States. Um, he, the um, biblical history is attached uh, to American history for in um, young Tarwater's uh, schooling. And so he has yet to experience the barrage of visual images and photographic or otherwise that shape the historical world. So when old tar Tarwater dies and young Tarwater begins on his pilgrimage, then he has to um, face uh, the um, uh, mundane uh, uh, experiences of the modern world, um, like dialing a telephone uh, 
and we then begin to start seeing the modern world as they appear through um, young Tarwater's eyes and interpreted through the early history of the Bible. So O'Connor molds and shapes her readers' perceptions of reality by employing the photographic technique, by combining the emblematic understanding with the snapshot technique O'Connor is able to infuse her fiction with a sense of immediacy that reveals distortions in modern life. For the modern reader, the use of narrative pauses and the application of the camera eye provide a way to present the familiar visual text as distorted and unnatural. She writes, you have to make your vision apparent by shock. I see this as her project in uh, both The Violent Barrett Away and in Wisewood. So I wanted to end by returning to the images that I um, collected of the United States today. And um, the question that I, I end, um, end with is, what really is a slice of life in America? Um, and uh, do can we look at this um, assortment of images that surround us um, from raising from, as O'Connor has uh, demonstrated for us, raising us from the historical to the uh, anagogical. Um, can O'Connor give us insight on America today? And of course, I think yes, she can. So that's it. Thank you so much, Ruth. If anyone has any questions right now, feel free to type them into the chat, or if you'd like, use the raise your hand feature, and we will recognize you, and you can ask them to our speaker yourself this evening. So, Ruth, real quickly, do you, th what is it about um, these strange images that O'Connor places in her books and sort of conjures up in our minds that you think, um, make them so attractive to us that, you know, that, that we find some fascination with this grotesque, you know, is this something that's always been seated in our consciousness through art throughout history? Um, and, and how is it that O'Connor manages to capitalize on that? Well, I think one of the ways that, um, she does that is her images are, um, populated with the detritus of the modern world. They are, um, uh, you know, the abject objects, things that are all around us in our uh, modern existence, and also in that mid 20th century existence are uh, occurring and reoccurring. They're visual images we recognize. O'Connor takes them and she upends them. She turns them upside down in order to make meaning for us, in order um, to help to mold and to form the way that we then look at our world and look at ourselves. So I think because she starts with recognizable things. She, and she starts with a historical past, like putting um, Hazel Motes in a Vanitas tableau. Um, it, that uh, Vanitas is something that we recognize. Now, we might not recognize that upon the first reading or second reading or third reading of Weisblood, but the reality is it's something that we're familiar with. We're familiar with that tableau or that um, uh, uh, group of images that come together at that point. So I think familiarity, it's um, uh, populating, uh, you know, the, uh, with the detritus of, um, uh, on the streets of America. It's almost like uh, the 80s in art, uh, which O'Connor maybe foreshadowed, but, um, you know, never saw in her life. But it's like going to the streets, the art of the streets. Um, so anyway, yeah. Those are my opinions. We have some questions um, that came through the chat for you, Ruth. So the first one is from Robert, and he asked, do these same techniques show up in O'Connor's own paintings? Well, um, Bob, that is a thing that I would like to do an extensive study on. <laughs> um, that is a question. I feel that that is another, another book, that if the O'Connor paintings could be brought together and could be studied. Think of the richness 
of what we would learn in that. Now, the paintings that we have seen, um, there's one at Georgia College that, um, I'm trying to think, it's in, um, in one of the museum rooms, it's a, a Cubist painting, strangely, of, it's not one that you can find anywhere. The only place I've ever seen it is at Georgia College. And um, it's of people, uh, Cubist um, figures singing in a choir, in a church choir. And I think that that is a, would be really interesting in O'Connor and recognizing cubism and abstract expressionism. And what would that mean? Um, what does that mean about uh, O'Connor and how she um, uh, incorporated um, these uh, kinds of art movements into her life? Um, of course, they're the face uh, one with the, um, you know, with the peacock, uh, the portrait um, that she really liked of herself. And, you know, that's an iconic American image there. Um, it's, uh, so she, in, in my opinion, uh, but I have not, I would love to study O'Connor's paintings. That would be, that would be, uh, you know, that would be, I would throw away the project I'm working on right now to do that um, and spend the rest of my life studying those paintings and then tying them in with the writings and with her life. But yeah, but anyway, hi, Bob. And I don't, um, I wish I could answer that. I wish that I had um, the access to the painting so I could. What do you yes. think? Oh. Ruth, we have another no. one. Uh, from Monica, and she says, I loved your reading of Lenora's 90. I'm going to be thinking about it a lot. What's another object like that that you think we should think more about? Well, um, Leora's, every, all of the objects, I obsessively wrote about in the book about the uh, things that surround of Leora, that character speaks to me because that is a character that when I was teaching American Lit, um, I see my friend um, and fellow teacher, American Lit teacher Becky here, and um, we would talk about those women who lived on the outsides uh, of town, the, uh, the women that were alone. These are women who don't have a man to support them and no way to support themselves. And so they would do things like create potions and uh, do things, even, um, you know, do things to, uh, even Hester Prynne is one of these women, but she happens to have the art of embroidery to support herself. And I think that we need to look at those women. I do a lot of writing in the book about Ruby um, because she is another one of these women who, um, and I write about her uh, quite a bit in A Stroke of Good Fortune. That picture of Ruby in A Stroke of Good Fortune at the uh, bottom of the stairs holding a bag of groceries with her head appearing. O'Connor describes her head alongside the cans of beans and the collard green stuck to her cheek and uh, her mulberry dyed hair. Um, her head is a grocery. Her head is, is uh, O'Connor forms this grocery collage there and her body is shaped like a funeral urn. So, um, these are, uh, Monica, these are the things that just, these are the things that just popped out to me um, when I was reading about the women. The, um, you know, the, the women spoke to me and there are, you know, and the women in the uh, short stories, Sarah Ruth, oh my gosh, love that woman. Um, so anyway, uh, she's in, she, Sarah Ruth is, uh, and Parker are the conclusion of my book. But I did, I had to cut them. I had to cut them yesterday. So they left the PowerPoint. So, all right, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Oops, sorry, I was going okay. between the chat and the microphone. Um, actually, Ooh. Monica continued and said, all of the things on the stairs too. I love the idea of abject items around the women. I love that too. I love when she sits on a gun. I mean, wow, what image. 
um, is what a, a better image of America than Andy Warhol's gun on that stairway. But that's just my, of course, again, my opinion of that gun, but okay. Um, also, we have a, a comment from Mary Lynn that says, the grandmother in Good Man also has an interesting description of her clothing. Clean, not clean, nice underwear in case she is found dead on the road. <laughs> That's I love my all mother. the noise going on in the room. It's like you can see people nodding. It's like, yes, we remember this from this story. Yes, yes, yes. I do write about the grandmother in the book and her hat and her little white collar. The grandmother is still of an age. Uh, she says my mother's age. Um, the wearing of the clean underwear um, in case you die uh, is a thing that my mother would say, you know, don't leave home without clean underwear. Um, so uh, that, and so the grandmother, the grandmother, I see her, even though she doesn't look like one of the Helen Hokinson women, but she's one of the older women that cling to a past um, that never really existed. The grandmother, the past for the grandmother, she uh, quotes Gone with the Wind. She calls, uh, and she learned about the uh, Southern past from Gone with the Wind. Um, those are the visuals that she has in her head. And so she is, um, you know, she's another one of those women, like the ones that I talked about that in the New Yorker cartoons that cling to some um, strange non-existent past and maybe the underwear um, clings to that maybe someone sometime in the past had dirty underwear when they died I don't know so. <laughs> excellent Allie do we have anyone um, who has raised their hand or anything like that not that I can tell no not that you can tell Excellent. Well, does anyone else have any other questions for our guests this evening? You can type them in the chat real quick or just go ahead and raise your hand. Well, while we're waiting, I would also like to point out, you know, coming up, we have two other wonderful events about Southern authors. We have an event coming up for Understanding the Short Fiction of Carson McCullers, also from Mercer University Press, and another program about Carson McCullers, when Fiction and Philosophy Meet, of course, this is a conversation between Flannery O'Connor and Simone Wheel. Um, going to be a very interesting presentation. Um, both authors will be there, one reading as Flannery and one reading as Simone. I'm sure you all will enjoy that one as well. But, oh, here we go. We've got one more. And this is from Fernanda. I believe this is our guest from Italy. I saw that earlier. I believe this is our guest from Italy. Are there any images of children that you find particularly interesting? Um, yeah, one of the images that I write about, um, it's uh, in the, um, I, I think it's, oh, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say for sure if I don't remember, but it's, um, it has to do with a good man is hard to find. There is, um, when the grandmother is looking um, backward or they're looking for the, um, the plantation or the mansion that she wants to show her grandchildren, to show them um, the past, um, then uh, there is an, a little um, African-American girl um, standing in the road and um, the grandmother calls her a pickaninny and uh, turns around and looks at her out the back window and um, that image through the frame of the back window of the car, um, that image of that young uh, girl standing there um, and the grandmother and the words that the grandmother is saying about the young girl is an image that is cemented um, in my mind, a child uh, image. And there are children um, in and out um, throughout, but uh, that's the one that I think sort of falls under um, my formula, my formula of um, a, a stop frame visual, um, visual kind of image. Ruth, for those of us who maybe want to look a little deeper into Flannery O'Connor, what are some books that you can recommend um, that we could read 
um, to further our, our understanding. Oh my gosh, if I had known you were gonna ask that, I would have made a list. I always say titles wrong. Um, <laughs> Um, let me see. I'll look at some of them. Uh, these, I can tell you some of the ones that I consulted. Um, if you're particularly um, interested in Flannery O'Connor, um, the uh, cartoons of O'Connor that I mentioned um, by Kelly Gerald. Um, uh, let me switch down. Uh, American Gargoyles, Anthony DiRenzo. Um, uh, Rob Donahue, O'Connor, and the uh, Feminine Mystique. Um, Driggers and Dunn, I even, uh, I learned so much by reading their books, describing uh, what's in the manuscripts uh, at Georgia College. Um, let's look, uh, Sarah Gordon um, is, uh, it was just uh, a tremendous, amount of help to me, uh, Flannery O'Connor in the Obedient Imagination. Um, I did a lot of reading also on Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne got cut from the PowerPoint this morning um, because uh, I wanted to talk about the connection uh, between O'Connor and American romance. I do talk about it in my book, but it just seemed like too large of a deviation. Um, uh, for to fit into this uh, presentation. Um, so let me see, uh, Claire Kahane, The Revision of Rage, Flannery O'Connor and Me. Um, so anyway, I'm just going through Carl Martin, Flannery O'Connor's Prophetic Imagination. Um, any of these, uh, you know, I have a couple, two bookshelves full of books about O'Connor and um, any, I can find something in every one of them that gives me some kind of window into um, my own uh, research and analysis. And Monica mentioned the um, brand new book, Radical Ambivalence, about racism in O'Connor's work is fantastic. She also mentioned Brad's Gooch's biography is quite good. And that we is the biography, here. Monica, that I followed religiously. That uh, I love that because it read like a novel, <laughs> which um, is my vision of a really good biography, is <laughs> if it reads like a real story of a person's life. But um, the radical ambivalence I have here on the table next to me, and I did attend the Andalusia Institute um, presentation on that, and it made me want to uh, get uh, busy and read that book. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yes, thanks for suggesting that. Does anyone else? have suggestions of books that you think are particularly um, interesting or? Actually, recently, I have not read The Radical Ambivalence yet, but um, I did get in um, Angela O'Donnell's book of poetry, The Andalusian Hours that she wrote, the poetry from the front floors of Andalusia. I enjoyed this one. Um, so hopefully we'll be um, having a poetry reading coming up shortly with her, so. Um, but I found yes. that very interesting too, that the knowing that radical ambivalence came out and then seeing the poetry that she wrote at Andalusia, I thought was a very interesting thing. Oh, one other person who I really, um, really learned from was uh, Bruce Gentry's work on the uh, women of Wiseblood. Um, that, uh, the essays that he wrote about uh, those women really um, help, you know, I wa walked hand in hand um, with, then I built off of those essays um, to formulate my own interpretations um, of the women of Wiseblood, too. Um, and that, I can't remember, oh, Wendy uh, Piper wrote the, um, oh, here it is, Misfits, Marble, and Marble Fawns, Religion and Romance in Hawthorne and O'Connor. Um, the, the way that um, Hawthorne sees herself as a descendant, I mean, O'Connor sees herself as a descendant of Hawthorne and the, um, the uh, aspects or criteria um, of American romanticism that O'Connor uses in her stories and in her novels to me is um, thrilling. Uh, just that sort of hand-in-hand -hand relationship with Hawthorne 
Um, and I kind of, in the end of the book, I talk about um, the um, Parker's back being an upended um, uh, version of the Scarlet Letter of when uh, Dimsdale and Hester um, meet um, in the woods. And then I sort of compare that to uh, Parker and Sarah Ruth. So, but anyway. Well, thank you so very much, Ruth, for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone, for allowing us to come into your homes and have this wonderful chat. Don't forget, if you're looking for a copy of the book, Karis Books and More here in um, Decatur, Georgia, has those for you and will be more than happy to mail them out to you. Thank you to Mercer University Press for, of course, being in contact with you, Ruth, and helping us set up this event this evening. And once again, thank you all so very much. Stay safe and keep reading, and we will see you all again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Bye.